Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well, chancellors love to extract a rabbit from a hat, but the big surprise of today was not the usual treat. It was that levy on sugary drinks. Jamie Oliver and no doubt Mary Poppins will approve, but will it work? A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. The medicine go down. Medicine go down. Less than six months ago, David Cameron ruled out taxing sugar saying there were more effective ways of tackling obesity. But today... I can announce that we will introduce a new <coughs> sugar levy on the soft drinks industry. A tax on sugary drinks was the big surprise of the budget. One of the biggest contributors to childhood obesity is sugary drinks. The sweetest of victories or a bitter taste? Well, that depends on your tipple. I'm over the moon. I'm surprised and it gives me huge hope. We're extremely disappointed. The truth is that the soft drink sector is the only food and drink category that has been taking sugar out of its products. The tax will be levied on soft drinks with more than 5 grams of sugar per 100 millilitres, with a higher charge on those with 8 grams or more. A can of Coke or Iron Brew contains around 35 grams. The Treasury says it will consult, but research suggests a 10 to 20 percent price increase would be needed to cut sales. That would put around eight pence on the price of a can of fizzy drink. But will it change behaviour? I'll probably save up my money to go and buy the fizzy drink instead of me buying like a healthy food in the afternoon or in the morning. I think it's good that they put a tax on it in terms of uh, obesity. There is a big problem there. A 10% tax in Mexico saw sales fall by around the same amount. The Chancellor says he expects the move to raise £520 million in the first year. Critics point out that the least well-off may be hardest hit. And with other sweet treats exempt, people's pockets may suffer more than their waistbands. So will the big surprise from the budget solve our obesity crisis? Joining me is Asim Malhotra, who's founder of the campaign group Action on Sugar, and Tim Rycroft from the Food and Drink Federation. Tim, let me ask you first, is it now accepted, do you think, that sugar is a sin? I think that... Obesity is caused by calories. Calories from all sorts of nutrients, sugar, fat, alcohol, fibre, protein. So I don't understand why you would have a policy that singled out one nutrient in the diet. So you're not a bogeyman? Definitely not. Uh, Asim, well, is first, he the bogeyman? The first thing I would say is actually I would argue that sugar doesn't have any nutritional value whatsoever. I would argue that you couldn't even call it a nutrient because it has no biological requirement. And contrary to what the food industry wanted to believe, you don't require any carbohydrate from sugar for energy. But on top of that, Cathy, what I would say is this goes beyond obesity because sugar has become so pervasive and the scientific evidence is telling us now that the effects of adverse effects of sugar on health are independent of body weight, so increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, abnormal inflammatory cholesterol, and just looking at teeth alone, the commonest cause of hospital admissions in children is tooth decay, commonest cause of chronic pain in children is tooth decay, okay. single most important factor, public enemy number one in the Western diet, sugar. Your public enemy number one? Well, the, the government figures show that even for the children who drink the most sweetened drinks, it's only giving them about 5% of their total calories. I see. Well, actually, um, is that true or not? It's difficult. Well, uh, the, the information that I'm aware of is about a third of all sugar consumption in children comes from sugary drinks. So, so actually, you know, the, the effects are independent of calories. And on top of the sugary drinks issue, Kathy, um, we know that 80 percent of processed foods have added sugar, and the the effects biologically, even interfering with hormones that control appetite, in effect. The sugar is um, stimulating appetite as well, so its, okay. it's, it's effects are independent of calories. There's quite a lot of evidence that a tax on sugary drinks would have some impact. I mean, the Public Health no, England research, Mexico, 6% no, decline in purchases of sugary drinks. Mexico, Do you dispute all of that? Six calories per person per day impact on actual consumption. Well, 
you know, this has just started, but if you, know, if you look at... If you learn from but that's history, six calories a day. It doesn't sound great. Well, it's not about the calories, though, Cathy. I'm saying that the effects of sugar are independent of calories. And we know that um, modelling from Oxford researchers has shown that 20% tax on sugary drinks within one year would prevent 180,000 people in this country from becoming obese. Respond to that. Well, modelling studies depend on assumptions, and I don't agree with the assumptions that that study has made. If you look at a real-life example in Mexico, you see that the impact on obesity is very, very small and short-term. So this sugar tax is not going to have any impact no. as far as you're concerned on obesity. But the big question, though, is whether the drinks manufacturers will pass on the cost of this Well, tax, the, the right? Red Book figures assume that they will. I mean, that will be a commercial decision for them to make. But, but I think what decision do you think they will make? I have no idea. I mean, they will, they will have to look at all the details. You're representing them, though. I mean, you must have a Well, this is, this is news that, as you say, has emerged today rather surprisingly, given that the government had said they were against this policy. And we will have to see how the companies respond. But I think it's pretty poor treatment for a sector that's done so much to provide more healthy choices for consumers that they should be slapped with a tax like this. They're doing a lot already. I don't think there is actually much that's being done, to be perfectly honest, Cathy. And the problem is we want consumers to exercise personal responsibility. And to do that, you need two things. You need choice. We need the right information. We've got neither. Because sugars become so unavoidable, they're a lot hidden. I mean, most sugar consumption actually is from hidden sugars, from foods that people don't often associate as having sugar in them that are marketed as healthy, like low-fat yogurts, for example, um, salad dressings, ketchup. So it's become hidden, therefore people can't access personal responsibility because of lack of information. And then even when the la on, in terms of the labelling, it's very confusing for consumers. The current labelling in the UK on sugar is actually quite astounding. It suggests we should be consuming 22 teaspoons of sugar a day, World Health organization recommends a limit of six teaspoons let's get better labeling so people can understand what they're consuming okay, you've invited this what some people see as nanny statism by failing to give consumers the information they need no that's quite wrong I mean the, the soft drinks industry only last year made a promise to take 20% more calories out of soft drinks already 60% of all the soft drinks sold in this country are no or low sugar huge progress has been made and the, the right way to continue that progress is to encourage the manufacturers not to penalize them Tim Rycroft and Asim Malhotra, thank you very much for joining me. I've been getting away with it all my